page 54. This is the most important lecture in the whole review. Everyone will get at least 15 questions on this. You'll think this is all your test was sometimes. Most people just dead guess on these ones. I don't want you dead guessing. And if they don't get dead guess, they use ABCs. I don't want you using ABCs on this. So let's talk about how you prioritize. Prioritization, delegation, and staff management. The first skill is prioritization. They will be testing to see how you prioritize four different patients. Number one, you are deciding which patient is sickest or healthiest. Now, be sure you know which one you're looking for, because sometimes they, they have you looking for the sickest, highest priority, and sometimes they have you looking for the lowest, healthiest priority. For example, if they said, there's been a disaster in your town, and you have to discharge one of the following people to make room for incoming wounded, who would you discharge? Would you be looking for the highest priority client, or the lowest priority client? Lowest. lowest. But if they said to you, you receive report on all of the following four patients, which patient will you check first when you get out of report? What would you pick? Highest. So the, the point is, sometimes you're picking the highest, sometimes you're picking the lowest. Make sure you keep that in your mind, because sometimes you can start out looking for the lowest, and halfway through the question, start looking for the highest. You see, so don't get turned around in the middle of the question. Okay, example. Now, four rules for pri Okay, that's that. Um, oh, is Linda's not there? Um, Sorry, I have to write this way. I just don't have any more open transparencies. Um, what they will do in the answers, the answers will always have four parts. They'll have an age, a gender, a diagnosis, and a modifying phrase. So the answers will always be a 10-year-old male with hypospadias who's throwing up bile stained emesis. Well, the age is the age, the gender is the gender, the diagnosis is hypospadias, and the modifying phrase was who's throwing up bile stained emesis. You got that? They always have an age, a gender, a diagnosis, and a modifying phrase. Two of those are totally irrelevant and you do not use them in your answer. Which two are irrelevant? Age and gender. When you prioritize, completely get rid of the age, completely get rid of the gender. You understand though, in pediatrics, in a pediatric question, you've got to pay attention to the age. But in a prioritization question, you don't pay attention to the age. Because a two-year-old is not more valuable than a 90-year-old. They're both humans. Do you understand what I'm saying? So age is not a criteria whereby you prioritize. Gender is not a criterion by which you prioritize. Women are not more valuable than men. And men are not more valuable than women. They're, it's irrelevant. Okay, the diagnosis is important. And the modifying phrase is important. Which one is more important? The modifying phrase. The modifying phrase is always more important. So, if the patient had... Sorry. I'll get rid of this. Okay, if the patient had angina pectoris versus myocardial infarction. 
angina pectoris versus myocardial infarction, who's the higher priority person? The heart attack, the MI. However, look at this. With unstable BP, with stable vital signs. I added a modifying phrase. Do you see that? Now, who's a higher priority? The angina, because he has what? Unstable blood pressure. The myocardial infarction, they told me, was stable because he has stable vital signs. So, here we have low priority, high priority, high priority, low priority. We always pay more attention to which one? Modifying phrase, so he's the higher priority, he's the lower priority, regardless of this. Do you see that? That's why you can't use ABC. That's one of the many reasons why you can't. So this person is more stable, this is more unstable, here's your higher priority, here's your lower. So always break the tie in favor of the modifying phrase. All right? Now let's go to the four rules for prioritization, the four rules. Rule number one, acute beats chronic. Acute beats chronic. What do I mean by beats is, is a higher priority than. In other words, an acutely ill person is a higher priority than a chronically ill person. Now, let's look at this, how this works out. If you had the following patients, a COPD, a CHF, and an appendicitis, who would be the higher priority? Exactly. Why? Because what are the other two? Chronic illnesses, the appendicitis is acute. If you used ABCs, who would be your highest priority client? COPD and you'd be dead wrong. Are you seeing what I'm talking about? So acutely ill, would you agree with me that an acute gut is a higher priority than a chronic lung? Absolutely. So acute beats chronic, it's not ABC. Okay, next one, rule number two on the next page. Rule number two. Fresh post-op, fresh post-op. Now, how fresh would fresh be? How many hours? 24. 12. 12. Not 24. 12. So any post-op in the first 12 hours is a fresh post-op. Fresh post-op beats medical or other surgical. Fresh post-op beats medical or other surgical. Okay, so what about this? <coughs> of those people, who is your highest priority? A COPD, -er, a CHF, -er, an acute appendicitis, a two hour post cholecystectomy, and a second post op day coronary artery bypass graft? Who's your highest priority? The two hour post cole. Why? They're fresh post op. And that beats what? Medical and other uh, surgical. What about this? and a radical neck dissection. Who would win? Two hour post coli. And a bilateral above the knee amputation. Who would win? Two hour post coli. And a right frontal craniotomy. Who would win? The two hour post coli. What's my point? doesn't matter how bad the surgery is or how involved the surgery is. If you aren't 12 hours in, you aren't high risk. You're recovering. 
that fresh post op is much more unstable than this guy, no matter what was done. So don't go on all of this stuff. Go on these time frames. Are you seeing that? Okay. <laughs> rule number three. This is my favorite rule. I use it. I don't even. I, don't, I use it. This is the one I use. And that is unstable beats stable. Unstable beats stable. So that means unstable people are a higher priority than stable people. Duh. Who knew that? before you went to nursing school. Who knew that in seventh grade? So then why don't you get these questions right all the time if you knew that? Why? Because you don't get them right. Why don't you get them right? You know this, then why don't you get it right? Yeah, in the question, there's all these words and you were never taught what words count for stability and what words count for instability. No school teaches that. I'm going to teach you that right now. It's Cedarville. I always tell the, tell the faculty when faculty meetings, we got to teach the students what stable and unstable means. Oh, we do, we do. No, they don't. I go in their classes, I listen, and they talk in platitudes. You know, if it's life-threatening, it's high. Well, then tell me what's life-threatening, guys. I mean, you can't just be... I, I need concrete, specific things to look at. So we're going to generate some concrete, specific lists here. Words to look for in an answer. Do you see the two lists? One list says things that make a patient stable, and the other says things that make a patient unstable. What do I mean by things? Words. Words in an answer or modifying phrase that makes the patient either what? Stable or unstable. So that you can actually take this to a question and use it and you'll know what you're talking about. Okay, let's go through the list of things that makes a patient stable. Let's start there. What makes an answer stable? Number one, let's start real easy. Use of the word stable. <laughs> no, I'm serious. People, I don't know how many people will say, well, it says they're stable. But, you know, they could just, like, you know, in a second later, they could just, like, decompensate, and, and they could herniate, and then they could die, and, and that could happen in seconds. So while it's saying it's stable now, they're really like a ticking time bomb, so I'm going to put them high priority. No! They said they were stable. They're stable. Don't argue with the fact that they said they were stable. You have to answer it at this moment in time for this patient. If they said this patient was stable right now, what are they? Stable. And if they destabilize in one second, we're not talking about that. Do you understand what I'm saying? We're talking about right now when they're talking about this patient. So let's go across to the other list. Things that make a patient unstable. What do you think number one is there? Unstable. Use of the word unstable. And don't argue whether you think they would be unstable or not. They said they were. Okay, next. Go back to stable. Go back to the stable column. We're going to bounce back and forth between stable. And, you see what we're going to do here? Okay, stable. One thing that makes a patient stable. Number two, chronic illness. Chronic illness makes you stable. So go to the unstable side. Number two, what makes a patient unstable? Acute, Acute illness. What rule is that? That was rule number one, wasn't it? The reason why I like this rule is because it, it grandfathers rule number one into it. Okay, go back to the stable side. A phrase that makes you stable. Post-op greater than 12 hours. If the patient is post-op greater than 12 hours, they are stable. So what makes a patient unstable? Post-op less than 12 hours. Now what rule is that? That was rule number two. So I use rule number three because it includes rule number one and rule number two. Okay, go back to something that makes you stable. Go back to the stable. 
local or regional anesthesia. If you had a procedure with local or regional anesthesia, you are stable. So what makes you unstable? General anesthesia. But only in the first 12 hours. Go back to stable, things that make you stable. Lab abnormalities of an A or B level. Lab abnormalities of an A or B level. What am I talking about? Remember this morning? Yeah. If you got a lab abnormality, yes, it's abnormal, but it's an A or a B, guess what the patient is? Stable. Okay, then what makes you unstable? Lab abnormalities of a C or a D. So who's unstable? A client with a creatinine of 17.8 or a client with a potassium of 6.1? Potassium 6.1, because that's a D versus an A right there. Go back to things that make you stable. The phrases... Ready for discharge. And don't argue, oh, I don't really think they'd be ready for discharge that soon. I really don't think they would be. They said they were. They are. So don't argue it. Okay, ready for discharge. Uh, to be discharged. To be discharged. Or admitted longer than 24 hours ago. Admitted longer than 24 hours ago. So if the patient has been here longer than 24 hours, we assume they are what? Stable. Stable. And don't say, well, I don't think it would take that long to stabilize them. They said it. You go with it. So what makes a patient unstable? What phrases? Not ready for discharge. Newly admitted. Newly diagnosed. Or, or what? Admitted less than 24 hours ago. Exactly. Admitted less than 24 hours ago. Another one. Stable. Unchanged assessments. Unchanged assessments. Meaning the assessment is unchanged. It's the same as it's been. There's nothing new. Okay, what makes a patient unstable? Changing or changed assessments. There's something new. There's something different. Okay, we're almost done. Go back to stable. This is a long one, so get it down word for word. The patient is stable. Don't write it down. The patient is stable if they are, here we go, experiencing the typical expected Signs and symptoms of the disease with which they were diagnosed. 
experiencing the typical expected signs and symptoms of the disease with which they were diagnosed. A patient is stable if they are experiencing the typical expected signs and symptoms of the disease with which they were diagnosed. Go to unstable. The patient is unstable if they are, and get this down now, experiencing unexpected signs and symptoms. Unexpected signs and symptoms. The mistake that most students make when they prioritize patients is they prioritize based on symptom severity rather than symptom, symptom expectedness. In other words, if somebody has severe pain and somebody has mild pain, they will always prioritize the severe pain higher than the mild pain. And that's wrong. If somebody has kidney stones and they're having severe colic pain, are they stable or unstable? Stable. stable. Why? Do you expect severe colicky pain with kidney stones? Right. Yes. But somebody's having mild pain with a chest x-ray. Should you have mild pain with a chest x-ray? You should have no pain with a chest x-ray. So who's unstable? The mild pain with the chest x-ray is unstable. The guy with the severe pain with the kidney stone is stable. Did you see what I'm saying? Okay. Um, all right. Let's look at let's look at how we apply this. How do we apply this? I want you to tell me who the highest priority patient is here, and I want you to use the rules I taught you. Okay. You have a 16-year-old female with meningococcal meningitis, right? Who has had a temp of 103.8 since admission three days ago? That's your first patient. 16-year-old girl, meningococcal meningitis. She's had a temperature of 103.8 since she was admitted three days ago. The next patient is a 67-year-old male with irritable bowel syndrome who spiked a temp of 100.8. Three this afternoon. I want you to talk to your buddy and decide who, on the basis of the rules I gave you, not guessing, but on the basis of the rules I gave you, I want you to cite who is higher priority and why. <laughs> But I would have picked the other one if I would have been in the tent. Because now there's a change. I would say B. Is that expected? Yeah. Three days yeah. Yeah. All we got to do is what they do. How many would say, what, what are you guys saying? A or B? B. B is the answer. Now, what do we rule out right away here? A. Okay, so we can rule this out. And we can rule that out. Okay, now. Meningococcal meningitis, high or low priority? High, because it's what? Acute. Irritable bowel syndrome, high or low? Because it's 
Okay? Now that's our diagnosis. Let's go to our modifying phrase, which are going to be more or less important. More, more important. Okay. Who has had? What kind of language is that? Who has had? But what, what criteria are we talking about in your list there? Who said it? Unchanged. Unchanged. Who has had? So automatically that puts her what? Up or down? Down. down. A temp of 103.8. Now when you get a symptom, when you get a symptom on these questions, do not look at how bad it is. Look at whether it is what? Expected or not. Remember that? Typical expected. Do you expect kids with... Me- do you expect anybody with meningococcal meningitis to have a fairly high fever? Yes. Yes. So is this expected? Yes. So does that make her high or low priority? Uh, low. And to put the nail in the coffin, what phrase comes next? Mission Three days ago. And that puts her what? Remember, admitted more than 24 hours ago. So she's low. So how many highs does she have? How many lows does she have? Two or three. And all the lows are in what area? Modifying phrase. So we're thinking, thinking she's what? Low priority. Okay. Who spiked? Changing. Changed. High. Okay. Temp of 103. How do you deal with that? What do you say to yourself? Is it expected for an IBS? No, not low. Don't say low. Remember, I told you it's not severity, so don't be talking high and low. Ask, is it expected for an ibs or irritable bowel, to have a temp of 100.3? No. no. Actually, for them, it's high. It's not low. 100.3. So that's unexpected. So does that make him high or low priority? High, unexpected. And then to put the nail in the coffin, what did it end with? This afternoon, this afternoon which means it was new, changed, not been happening. So how many highs does he have? Two or three. How many lows? One. The highs are all in the modifying phrase. Who's your higher priority? B. Now let me ask you that. Does that make sense to you? Now in real life, I said this was low and this was high. Low priority, high priority, right? So who could go home? If it's true that this one's low, she can go home. This one's high, he cannot go home. Is that true? Yes, it is absolutely true. Why? If she goes home, do we know what's happening with her? Everything? Yes, we know the symptom. We know why she's got a 1038. We know what it is. It's been that way. We're going to send her home with a home health referral for what? IV antibiotics. And she's good to go. She can go home because she's stable. Can I send this guy home? Why can I not send him home? You don't know what's going on. Do you know what this is? It's not that. So what is it? You don't know. Do you know what this is? Yes. Do you know what this is? Yes, it's a symptom of that. Well, I knew she had that. Tell me something I didn't know. I can't send this guy home. This guy could probably, probably ruptured an ulceration, probably is developing septic peritonitis, and we're just catching his temperature on the way up. If I send him home, he's going to come in dead because he's going to go into septic shock and fade out during the night and no one knows it. Do you see why this guy, you can't send him home. He may die. This one, you can send home. How many of you would have picked the meningitis an hour ago? How many would have picked the irritable bowel an hour ago? Nobody? Nobody would have picked it? Do you see what I'm saying? But does it make sense? And do you see why it's true? Okay. Okay. Um, do you see where it says always unstable I want to give you four things that are always unstable regardless of whether it's expected or not so remember I told you when you look, get a symptom don't qualify how bad it is but ask is it, is it expected or not 
Well, there are four things that, just because they're there, makes you unstable. Number one, hemorrhage. If you are hemorrhaging, even if I expect it, <laughs> you're unstable, right? Yes. For example, if I said a client had DIC and hemophilia, which would be rare, but let's say they did, and I said he's hemorrhaging, I don't want you to say, well, you know, hemorrhaging, I would expect a client with DIC and hemophilia to hemorrhage. So since it's expected, it's low priority. Do you see the absurdity in that? There are certain things that even if they are expected are what? Serious, Serious and bad. So hemorrhaging is always bad even if you expect it. Does that make sense? Now, do not confuse hemorrhaging with bleeding. Those are two different things. Boards thinks bleeding, oh, hemorrhaging. You know, to them, it's, it, there's a huge difference between bleeding and hemorrhaging. So if you see bleeding, high or low? No, it depends on whether it's expected or not. I gotcha, I gotcha. <laughs> hemorrhaging, high or low? High, because it's one of those things. Okay, second one. High fevers. Over 105. 105 and over. Why? Even if it's expected, what will a person with a fever of 105 and over do? Cease. So that's high priority. Even, like, now, what, what could I have done to this meningitis girl to make her a high priority? Made her temp 105. And then, then she's, she's there. Okay? Hypoglycemia is the third one. A low blood glucose. A patient has hypoglycemia. Their blood glucose is 8. <laughs> Don't do this. Don't say, well, you know, I would expect a low glucose with hypoglycemia. So an 8 is stable. You see how stupid that is? If you got a low sugar, it doesn't matter if it's expected or not. You are in trouble. Okay? So hemorrhaging, high fever, Hypoglycemia. So far, they're all H's, right? And the last ones are pulselessness or breathlessness. If you are pulseless or breathless, even if it's expected, you are high priority. Now, how would that ever happen? Well, could you imagine a question like this? The patient has V-fib, ventricular fibrillation, or asystole, and you don't get a pulse. High or low priority? Well, you know, if they had asystole, I would expect them not to have a pulse, so they're okay. You see how stupid that is? You can't, you can't take this to the absurd. Do you see what I'm saying? And I'm trying to show you where the line is drawn. So, with pulselessness, breathlessness, hypoglycemia, hemorrhaging, and high fevers, what are they? Unstable, regardless of expected or not. But everything else obeys the rule of expectedness or not. Do you understand that? That's, that's the way to go with it. Hey, just a real quick question. When is pulselessness and breathlessness actually the lowest priority? At the scene of an unwitnessed accident. At the scene of an unwitnessed accident. If you find anyone who is pulseless or breathless, guess what? They are what? What did you say? They're dead. They're the lowest priority. But if you witness the problem, who's the highest priority? Pulseless, breathless. So knowing whether to prioritize pulselessness and breathlessness, highest or lowest, depends on witness or not. Was it witnessed? Was it not witnessed? <coughs> By the way, what are the three things that result in a black tag in an accident, in, at an unwitnessed accident? What are the three things that result in a black tag? You know what I mean by a black tag? Yeah. Tag them black and ship them last at an unwitnessed accident. Pulselessness, breathlessness, fixed and dilated pupils, even if they're breathing and have a pulse. 
Those are the three things. You can have any one of those. They're black tag at an unwitnessed. And the hardest one is someone who has fixed and dilated pupils who's still breathing. You know, that's the hard one to leave alone. You know what I'm saying? But you've got to go to somebody else. Somebody else needs your help more. All right, rule number three. No, rule number four on the next page. Rule number four. This is a tiebreaker. This is a tiebreaker. Caution. Only use this as a tiebreaker. I want to, I'm totally, trying to be totally honest with you. A lot of times when you use those previous rules, you end up with one or about two or three that could be it. So you need a tiebreaker. The tiebreaker says, the more vital the organ, the higher the priority. The more vital the organ, the higher the priority. Now just a caution here. The organ we're talking about, is it the organ of the diagnosis or the organ of the modifying phrase? The organ of the modifying phrase is what we're talking to. When you do your tiebreaker, do the tiebreaking with the organ in which the modifying phrase is happening, not the diagnosis itself. You got that? Okay, now, what I need to give you is the order of organ vitality. So here it is. The most vital organ in your body is your brain. The second most vital organ is your lung. The third most vital is your heart. The fourth is the liver. The next is the kidney. And the next is the pancreas. After that, no one agrees. So that, but that's good enough. That'll get you what you need. Brain, lung, heart, liver, kidney, pancreas. In that order. <clears throat> so, you have a 23-year-old. Does that matter? Male. With CHF. High or low priority? Low, because it's what? Chronic. With a potassium of 6.6. High, why? It's a CD. It's one of those CD levels. Okay? And no EKG changes. What would that do? Increase his priority or lower his priority? Lower, because they're saying at least he's not affecting the what yet? The heart. Okay. A chronic renal failure with a creatinine of 24.7. Higher low. Low. Higher low. No, I mean high priority, low priority. Why? For two reasons. It's an A level plus it's expected. And this is really not expected with that. And pink, frothy sputum. Why high priority? Lungs are filling up. Is a classic symptom of chronic renal failure pink frothy sputum so this person is unstable this guy is unstable but asymptomatic this guy is unstable and having unstable and having symptoms so this guy could be beating this guy it it will see alright a patient with acute hepatitis high or low priority acute hepatitis high with jaundice High or low? Low. Why? You expect jaundice with hepatitis. An increased ammonia level. Expected. Who you cannot arouse. Expected or unexpected with hepatitis? 
Unexpected. Okay, so that's a unexpected. So that's what? High. So we got an unstable here, an unstable here, and an unstable there. We got three unstable people, right? Okay, who's our highest priority? Okay, potassium. What organ system are we worried about? So we got a heart. Number one is a heart. Number two, we got a what? No, we don't have a kidney. Uh uh-uh, uh uh uh. We got a lung. Remember, you go with the modifying phrase, you don't go with the disease. So we got a lung. Right? And then, number three, we got a what? Don't say liver, right? We got a brain. Okay? So I go to my tiebreaker. Correct? And who wins? He wins. Are you seeing this? Does that help you? Can you replicate that? Can you actually do that when you go to take your boards? Okay. Does this change some of the ways you might do things? Does it make sense to you why you do it that way? Do you see why it's valid? Just say, tell me if they're stable or unstable. Angina pectoris. Why? Chronic. Okay. With crushing substernal chest pain. (coughs) Stable. Because that is expected with angina. Not relieved by rest or three nitroglycerin. Unstable. Because the definition of angina is chest pain relieved by... Rest and nitro. So if it's unrelieved, it's not angina anymore, it's MI, now they're unstable. Does everybody see what I'm saying on that? Okay. Delegation. Do not delegate the following responsibilities to an LPN. And LPNs, you're not allowed to assume the following responsibilities if an RN delegates it to you. Now, don't yell at me. I didn't write the list. Okay? I'm just reporting. So don't shoot the messenger. I know that 99% of the hospitals in in Ohio don't do this. But this is what the book says. Okay? Do not delegate the following to an LPN. Starting an IV. And you say, but what if they have IV certification? It didn't say they did, so you're not allowed to assume that they did. (coughs) Hanging or mixing IV meds. They're not allowed to hang or mix IV meds. Number three, pushing IV push meds. So what can they do in regard to an IV? Maintain. Maintain and document the flow. That's what they can do. D. They cannot administer blood or mess with central lines. They cannot administer blood or mess with central lines. So no central line flushing. If I had to go down to the wire on it, I would say they're not allowed to change a central line dressing. But if that was the only thing that they possibly could do, then I might let them do it. But it's going to be, you know, I'm going to really seriously not let them do that unless it's the only option. Letter, the next one, they're not allowed to plan care. The RN makes the care plan. The LPN can implement it but the RN does the care plan. The next one, they're not allowed to perform or develop teaching. What they can do is reinforce teaching. What's the difference between performing and reinforcing? Yeah. So, so if somebody needs taught about their diabetes, who should do the patient teaching regarding the diabetes? 
They are in. But can an LPN reinforce the necessity of doing an AccuCheck before you give insulin to a patient? Yes. They're not allowed to take care of unstable patients. So LPNs, that's why you need to know this stable, unstable thing, because you're supposed to know what you're allowed to accept and what you're not allowed to accept. You'd have taken the meningococcal meningitis kid, but you wouldn't take the IBS person, if you remember that illustration. They're not allowed to do the first of anything. If they're doing the first, I mean, if there's something that's being done for the very first time, who should do the very first? The RNs, because what are they going to do? Assess and care plan. So, can an LPN perform tube feedings? Yes or no? Sure. Can they do the first tube feed after a G-tube was inserted? No. Can they change post-operative dressings? Sure. Should they change the first post-op dressing the day of surgery? No. no. Can they feed stroke patients? Sure. But they shouldn't do the first feeding of the stroke patient after the feed. Can they ambulate post-op clients? Yes. Of course. Should they get the patient out of bed the very first time after surgery? No. no. Can they take vital signs? Should they take the first set of vital signs after a patient came back from surgery? No. no. And that's one that nobody ever does. But I do it as an RN. I even see hospitals that are so stupid that they let AIDS take the first set of vital signs <coughs> after surgery. That's ridiculous. Somebody's waiting for a lawsuit to happen on that one. You won't stand up five minutes in court if that happens. Yes? That is, RNs, boards would allow an RN to do the first dressing change. It is tradition to allow the surgeon to do the first one. Do you see my point? But boards is more, we as nurses, we are the world. You know, that kind of thing. You know, more assertive kind of thing. And you, are you with the last one now? They're not allowed to do the following assessments. They're not allowed to do the following assessments. Admission. Discharge. Transfer. <clears throat> or the first one after a change. The first assessment after there has been a change. Who has to do the first assessment after there has been a change? The RN, because they have to assess, plan, the whole bit. So what about this? In report, a nurse says, I think I heard crackles on that guy in 52. He's never had them before. I think that he has had them. I mean, no, he's had, I think I heard them. Who would be the person that should go assess that person in the morning? The RN. Something may have changed. Okay, um, so who should the LPN check? Who would you send the LPN to check? And LPNs, who would you go check? A patient with angina pectoris with crushing substernal chest pain who has admitted three days ago and is on nitroglycerin. A patient with a subtotal thyroidectomy two days ago, who says, why are they washing elephants in the parking lot? Who should the LPN check? Who should the RN check? A for the LPN, B for the RN. Why B for the RN? What's going on, man? Subtotal, subtotals get? Store. And what's a symptom of storm? Delirium. Delirium. It could be that that person's going into storm. We don't know. 
But the angina with the substernal crushing chest pain and the night, well, that's all totally. But why are they doing that? Why do they always give you the crushing substernal chest pain versus somebody that says, why are elephants in the parking lot? <laughs> they, they know that people, including nurses, when they hear crushing substernal chest pain, they go, what? Whoa. You know, and, and, but don't go, whoa, because it's no big deal. It's expected and you're going to treat it. And it's nothing. Does everybody understand that? Mm-hmm. Make sense? Okay. Um, now, do not delegate the following responsibilities to an aide. They won't call it an aide. They'll call them a UAP, uh, unlicensed assistive personnel. When they talk about a UAP, it's an aide, a tech. Here's what they're not allowed to do. Charting. Now, they can chart what they did, but they can't chart about the patient. They can chart what they did, but they can't chart about the patient. So could they chart side rails up, bed in low, call light in reach, bed bath given? Could they chart patient less anxious today, tolerated, ambulation well? No. No. Secondly, they're not allowed to give meds. Except for what? What meds can they give? Topical, over-the-counter barrier creams. AIDS can independently apply topical, over-the-counter barrier creams. So can they give nitroglycerin ointment? It's topical, but it's not over the counter. Okay, good job. Can they apply neosporin ointment? Technically, what? Because it's what? Not a barrier. Do you see what I'm saying? What about hydrocortisone cream? Probably not. What about A and D ointment? Alpha carry lotion. Yeah, see what I'm saying? So those bear creams they can do. What about e-lace ointment for the skin? Ace. Sounds like a what? Enzyme. It's probably not over the counter. Okay, but don't get bogged down on that because that's the one they'll least test because different states are somewhat different on that. Okay, the next one is they're not allowed to do assessments except for vitals and AccuChecks, which I think is stupid. Why do I think that's stupid? Why do we delegate the measurement of something called vital signs (laughs) and AccuCheck, which can go to brain damage? Why do we delegate those two most critical, (coughs) most important assessments to the least prepared person? I don't understand. I'd rather have them do my bowel sounds and and, uh, pulses, frankly. (laughs) My peripheral pulses and my bowel sounds. I'd rather have them listen to those than do the AccuChecks and the vitals. But why why can we do them? Why do they do them? What's the reason? Money. It's all money. So we're jeopardizing patients to save money. I do all my own vital signs. I do all my own active checks when I'm an RN working. And I work. And I never get out late. I can count on one hand the number of times I've been out after my quitting time. I am not one of those nurses. An hour after quitting shift, I'm still there doing my charting. I never do that. Ask anybody that's worked with me. I'm out of there. <laughs> I don't stay late. But yet I do all my own acu checks and all my own vitals. So you can't tell me that it's that, that you don't have time to do them. You do. I think the reason why I'm out on time is because I do my own stuff. What do I mean by that? I know what's going on. I'm on top of it. Nothing surprises me. It, it, nothing hits me at 6 o'clock when I look at the sheet and I go, Oh my goodness, his blood pressure is 90 over 10. You see what I'm saying? Nobody told me his blood glucose was 15. You see what I'm saying? I know it. I can tell. I boom, boom, boom. So watch pots never boil. So I'm just telling you, you know, I, I, don't, I don't buy it. So anyhow, but here's the deal. If 
If somebody comes back from surgery and I do a set of vitals and I do all my own set of vitals when they come back from surgery and the vital signs are unchanged from the PACU, you know, the recovery room discharge vitals, they're unchanged re relatively, I know my patient is what? Stable. Stable. So then I will tell an aide, check them. Do you see what I'm saying? But I, I do it sparing when I know what's going on and I'm checking on it. Okay, enough said on that one. Uh, next thing, they're not allowed to do treatments except for enemas. Figure that out. Doesn't take a rocket scientist. They can do enemas, but they can't do other things. Here's the deal. Be real cautious of allowing them to catheterize. But I, I'm not willing to say, never let them catheterize. I'm just telling you, if you can pick any other answer other than catheterize, pick the other answer. But if it would say catheterize a patient, give an IV push medication, intubate the client, <laughs> and irrigate the T-tube, what would you have them do? Yeah. Cat. Do you see what I'm saying? But if there's anything else that they could do, don't pick cat. Because Boris doesn't like a cat. One uh, aid, on, I know there's one big question on ATI, that was talking about what would you let an aide do and you were between having them empty the bag on an ileal conduit continent cock pouch and versus somebody or versus uh, evaluating the effects of range of motion I think it said Everybody was freaking out between this emptying this bag they never heard of, let alone, you know, an A doing it, versus range of motion. But that question was not about that. The question was about doing versus evaluating. You see? And people missed it. So look at your verbs, not just your nouns, on your A things. Maybe it's something like evaluating the effectiveness of a bed bath. Can they do a bed bath? Can they evaluate if no? So sometimes that verb can get you off the hook on that one. All right. Did we cover all that? What an aide is not allowed to do? Well, then what is an aide allowed to do? You may delegate, delegate ADLs, beds, baths, and activities of daily living. However, they should never do the first of any of that. Why? Who does the first? All right. Now, why in a extended care facility, why are LPNs allowed to do a lot of these things I said that they cannot do? Why could they do them in an extended care facility? What is assumed about the patient clientele in an in a extended care facility? They are stable. And therefore, an LPN can do many of the things that I said you can't do in those settings. So keep that in mind. <coughs> All right, staff manage. Oh, turn the page. Do not delegate to the family safety responsibilities. Do not delegate to the family, that's on the next page, safety responsibilities. Now what do I mean by that? Who's responsible for the safety of the patient? You are. So if a family member says, would you leave the restraints off my dad while I'm here? I'll watch and make sure nothing happens and I'll call you when I leave and you can put the restraints back on him. Yes or no? No. no. Saunders says yes. I'm telling you, no. The book is wrong. You cannot delegate safety to a non-hospital caregiver. What about a sitter? Yes, why can you delegate to a sitter? What does the sitter have to, what has to happen for them to be designated a sitter? You have to teach them and you have to put in the chart documentation that you what? Taught them. So the second sentence is, they can only do what you teach them to do. So if you decide and the doctor says that the mother can give 
this three-year-old kid the insulin shot. Okay? Can you do it? Yes, as long as you what? Document in the chart that you taught them. You put them through the same checklist that you would do with any new grad, new hire, on competency for insulin injection. And then you put that in the record and you're good to go. But you can't just let them do it without documenting, teaching, and their competency. What if a mother says this? Oh, would you... I, I'm not done finishing my baby yet. This is in the nursery. Would you just leave the side rail down and I'll finish bathing, then I'll put it up when I'm done. You can leave the room and go do, need, go do what you need to do. What do you say to them? No, I'll stay with you to help you with this bath. And when you're finished, I'll put the side rails up and then we'll be done. Because what will happen? If, does she get an in-service on putting up the side rails on a crib? No. So if she doesn't click it right and the baby rolls and bam and slam, who's going to be in trouble? Yes. You. Well, she asked me. Yeah, right. Like they're going to say, oh, then I give up the lawsuit because I asked you. You know, like that will never happen. So you can't do it. I can't understand why that book said, has anyone seen that answer where you're allowed to do that? I just, what, what book? I mean, not book, was it a book or was it a teacher test? It's actually online. I'm a I know. I couldn't believe that. I mean, are you kidding me? Just a, 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 unbelievable. Yes. With every single time they are hospitalized, if a person has been giving their own insulin injections for 90 years, every single time they're hospitalized, we have to go through the documentation for competency and have it in part of the chart. I know it'll drive them crazy, but they'll know the drill. Okay, staff management. How do you intervene? How do you intervene with inappropriate behavior of staff? How do you intervene with inappropriate behavior of staff? This is not prioritizing. This is not delegating. This is handling your staff when they do stupid things. And boards will give you those questions, too. Have you ever seen that? You're a nurse manager. You're the charge nurse. You're the LPN in charge. Or you're an LPN and the nurse does this and how you deal with it. Okay. Number one. Number two. There are always four answers. The same answers show up all the time. The first answer usually is something like, tell supervisor. Okay. Have you seen that as an answer to these kind of questions? The, a staff member is doing something stupid. What do you do? Tell the supervisor. That's always there. Number two, another one that's always there is confront them and take over immediately. That's always there. And a third one that's always there is at a later date, just talk to them about it. You don't have to do anything right now. You don't have to report it to anybody. Just talk to them. And the last one that is always there is ignore it. Just let it go. Ignore it. Now, one of those is never the answer. Which one is never the answer? Ignore. Ignore. Because you never ignore inappropriate behavior of staff. You always take it as an opportunity to teach and change behavior. Now, the other three could be right or could be wrong depending upon the situation. So what I want to teach you is how to choose between the remaining three options. When you get a staff question, the first question you should ask yourself is, number one, is what they are doing illegal? You see where I'm at? Is what they're doing illegal? That's number one. If the answer is yes, they are engaging in illegal activity, what is the answer that you always choose? Tell supervisor. That's always the answer. However, what if the answer is no? It is not illegal. Well, then go to the next question. The second question you ask yourself is, is anyone, the patient or the staff member, in immediate danger 
of physical or psychological harm. In other words, is anyone in harm's way? Is anyone in danger of physical or psychological harm? If the answer is yes, what do you pick? Confront immediately and take over because you don't want anybody to get hurt. Why don't you want to tell the supervisor? Yes, because delaying, confronting in order to go tell the supervisor would put the patient at risk. So you go, right? Now you may have to tell who later on, supervisor, but you got to deal with it right then and right there. Yes? Yeah, if it's illegal, and we're not there yet, but you're, you're ahead of me, but sometimes in certain situations it is both illegal and harmful. In that case, you do both, but in what order? Confront, then tell. But if it's, but look at this, if it's not harmful and illegal, what do you do? Not harmful, but illegal. Tell supervisor. But if it's illegal and harmful, you do both, but first you intervene and then you tell supervisor. Good point. That's a good question. Okay. Next one. What if the answer is no? Nobody is in harm's way. Well, then go to the next question. The last one. The third question says, is this behavior legal, not harmful, but simply inappropriate? If the answer is yes, what do you do? What do you pick? Approach them later on and talk to them. Just counsel them later on. No hurry, no rush. Okay, now I'm going to give you some scenarios, and I want you to tell me which one you'll pick. And I want you to ask those questions of yourself. Okay? You suspect... You suspect that a nurse, you're an LPN, you suspect that an RN with whom you work is diverting narcotics for private sale and use. Well, is that illegal? Yes. So what do you do? Tell the supervisor. Okay. Um, you're an LPN, you walk by the room of an aide who is giving perineal care to a patient and the aide is not wearing gloves. Is that illegal? No. no. Is anybody in harm's way? No. Who? The aide. the aide. So what do you do as the LPN? You go right in and say, let me take over. You wash your hands. You get gloves on and I'll help you finish. Got it? You're an LPN. You notice an RN going home every day with bulging pockets. What do you do? Is that illegal? No. Yeah, it could be stealing, right? So you what? Tell the supervisor. Okay, uh, you are an LPN in the OR. You're a circulating LPN in the OR. And you notice the surgeon during surgery contaminates the pinky of his left hand. What do you do? Is that illegal? No. Is anybody in harm's way? Yes. Who? Patient. Patient. So what do you say? Excuse me. <laughs> you just contaminated the pinky of your left hand. I have a glove right here for you. So what I'm uh, You're an LPN and an RN always gives report at change of shift and this LP RN always says exasperation instead of exacerbation when referring to COPD. So the RN is saying he's having exasperations of COPD. And they're saying it over and over again all the time. <laughs> so what do you do about it? Well, is that illegal? No. It should be, but it's not. Um, is anybody being harmed? No. So what would you do as an LPN? Say, hey, come here. Sometime later, at a good time, you'd say, hey, you know, I noticed you're always, you're always saying exasperation. Am I wrong? But I kind of thought it was exacerbation. Now, I could be wrong, but what do you, you know, what do you think? You know, I mean, that kind of thing. Because remember, when you have a problem with somebody else, 
What do you always talk in? I, not you. You know, as an LPN, you would say, you're wrong, you're always saying the wrong... Not a good idea. I mean, it's okay to do that, but that's the wrong phrasing. Okay, um, are you getting it? Kind of getting the idea of how you're going to do that. Yes? I have a question. The first example that you said was uh, that the RN is diverting drugs. So, does that imply that the patients that she diverting skin for are not getting that medication? No, that does not imply that. Now, if it says this, you are an RN. One of your fellow RNs was passing narcotics to a bunch of patients. You notice that he is somewhat incoherent and not as attentive as usual. What would you do? Yeah, I would. There, you've got illegality, and the patients that he's caring for could be in jeopardy. So you've got what you were talking about, harm and illegality. So first you would say to him, you, you should, you're over here, you stay over here, you're not touching any patients anymore, and then you call the supervisor and get it, get it going. Okay. But if they want harm to be there, don't, don't imagine it in the second degree, just kind of, it, it'll be pretty clear for you. Question? What if you was an LPN and you seen a, another, a, a nurse taking the patient's pill an in RN? her mouth? An RN yeah. or an LPN. Either. Either so if you're an LPN and, and you observe an RN taking a pill. Would you confront him right then or would you go tell the supervisor? Okay. Yeah, I would probably, at that point in time, there could be harm. Because what is that being taken and could it affect their care? Do you see what I'm saying? Because I actually saw him take it. Now, if they're diverting narcotics with accounts, I don't know what they're doing there. They could be just, you know, falsifying records. But I saw him take a pill, so I go up and say, what is that pill you just took? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then I might tell the supervisor if it wasn't something that was logical explanation or if I thought was a problem. Is you see what I'm saying? Yeah, so you confront them. You confront them, yeah. Okay. Even, if, even if you see a doctor comes out of the medication rooms and swallows a pill. What do you say? What are you doing? And you're an LPN. What was that pill you just swallowed? And, and even though you may not feel, oh, it's a doctor. No, boards want you to go after them. Boards just gets goosebumps when you go after doctors. <laughs> <laughs> they love it. It makes them quiver. You know. what, on a HESI test, would it be the answer the same way? I, don't know, I think so. Okay. I think so. Okay. HESI's favorite question about inappropriate behavior is not staff. Their favorite one is, you've got two patients who are engaging in sexual intercourse in a room. What do you do? You shut the door. <laughs> no, that's the Hesse answer. You shut the door and let them do it. That's the, that's, that's the answer? No, I'm I mean, that's the answer on Hesse. I'm telling you. Wow. Isn't it? Have you, take, have you had the Hesse and taken that one? Was that the answer? That was the answer? Yeah. So anyhow, that, they love that one. That one shows up all the time. I think it's one of their favorite questions. Okay. Um, and also, they'll, or they'll say masturbation, you know, which is you just shut the door. You know, that's another big one. Okay. Let's go to the last lecture, and we'll be done. Last lecture. Before I start it, I want to direct you to the last two pages. Sorry, this belt is not the right size. I always have pants on the ground, so I have to pull them up. Okay, the first one is, do you see the abdomen there? It's divided into four quadrants. What this is about is they will ask you to point and click where you would find the organs. Where's the liver? Where's the pancreas? Where's the right kidney? Where's the left kidney? Where's the spleen? Where's the ascending colon? Where's the descending colon? Where's the... You see what I'm saying? And so what you've got to be able to do is click on the correct quadrant. Now, they give you a little bit of leeway with this one. As long as you're in the general vicinity, they're going to count it. Now, the next one, the next page, is a point and click for auscultating the valves of the heart. The aortic, aortic, 
the aortic, the pulmonic, the tricuspid, and the mitral, A-P-T-M. Now this one you have to get exactly over the spot. There's no leeway on this one. So the aortic is in the second right intercostal space. Pulmonic is in the second left intercostal space the tri at the sternal border. These are all at the sternal border. The tricuspid is in the fourth intercostal space at the left sternal border. And the mitral valve is in the fifth intercostal space in the mid-clavicular line. So let me go over those again. The aortic is in the second intercostal space second intercostal space at the right sternal border. The pulmonic is in the second intercostal space at the left sternal border. The tricuspid is in the fourth intercostal space at the left sternal border. And the mitral valve is in the fifth intercostal space in the mid-clavicular line, meaning the line down from the midpoint of the clavicle. So those are the things that, that those are the point and clicks. Now the other point and click they always have is uh, the pulses. Where's the carotid? Where's the brachial? Where's the radial? Where's the femoral? You sh I'm not even giving you that because I think you should know that. Question. Herb's point, they don't, they don't usually talk about herbs, but that's the third intercostal space at the left sternal border. It's right between the pulmonic and the tricuspid. So actually it goes A, pet, M. A, pet, and pet goes down that border line, P-E-T, and then M goes off to the side, A, pet, M. But they've never asked about herbs. Question? Excuse me? The apical pulse would be the mitral area. Yeah, the apical pulse would be where then? Fifth, intercostal space, main clavicular line. Now, go back to page 70 and we'll finish up. I have given you a lot of information. And I've given you a lot of application of that information. And that's going to serve you well. But I can't teach you everything that they could possibly ask. Because if I taught you more, they would just ask harder stuff. And if I taught that, they would just ask harder stuff. And if I taught that, they would just ask harder stuff. So where do we stop? But well, we're not getting on that merry-go-round. I'm teaching you the basic stuff that you need to know to pass. Now, you all are going to have to guess. Everybody in this room is going to have to guess an awful lot on this test because it is a computer adaptive test and that is the nature of computer adaptive testing. If I took the test, would I fail? No way. It's impossible for me to fail. I could never fail this test. But would, it be really, would I have to guess a lot on it? Yes. Why? Because it's computer adapted and it would try to camp out on stuff I didn't know which would be pediatrics. You know, not, you know, that would be the area I would be weakest in. Okay, so let's talk about how you guess. Because I want to help you out there too. How do you guess? Now, what I am concerned about is a lot of reviews give you a lot of guessing skills and guessing strategies. And that's dangerous. Because when your anxiety goes up, what do you revert to? Using fancy little guessing skills and guessing strategies instead of using your knowledge and your common sense. So, what do I want you to use first when you answer a question? Knowledge. knowledge. If your knowledge is failing you, what do you use? Common sense. When common sense fails you, what do you use? A guessing strategy. And some of these reviews just tell, tell you all these guessing strategies and then you go to take the boards and you're trying to figure out what guessing strategy to use instead of answering the question. And it actually makes you worse. Okay? So I don't, I don't, I'm just cautioning you about these. 
These are what you use when you don't know what's going on. Okay, sight questions. The best sight question, if you're totally clueless on it, the best psych answer is the nurse will examine their own feelings about. Why is that the best? Why is it best that the nurse examine their own feelings about something in psych nursing? Yeah, because that way you don't counter transfer. Remember counter transference? The patient reminds you of your dad, so you treat him dirty because you didn't like your dad. You know what I'm saying? So you have to examine your own feelings before you're a good therapist in psych. Secondly, in psych, another really, really good answer in psych is establish a trust relationship. Why would that be a good guess in psych? Establish a trust relationship. Because if you pick something else, what would you be saying? It's not that important to establish a trust. Oh, I don't think so. Now, now don't use your... You know, understand what I'm saying? Don't use... Here's, here's where common sense should be applied before this rule. You have a schizophrenic client who has a knife who is about to stab you. What is the most important thing to do? Establish a trust relationship. Run the other way. What's the answer? Run the other way. But Mark said establish a trust. Do you hear what I'm saying about using these cutesy little rules before you use your common sense? Okay. Nutrition. I tell you what, I have, to, I have to guess all the time in nutrition, particularly in those answers where they say, what meal would be good? And then A would be like baked potato, boiled bacon, and fried cheese, and a guacamole peanut butter milkshake. And the other one is a chicken tenders, green leafy vegetable salad, tofu, custard, and a slice of bread. See, you know what I'm saying? And they've got all the... Oh, man, I just crashed and burned on those. But I figured out a guessing strategy that gets me about 75% right, even when I don't know anything about it. My rule is, in a tie, pick chicken. (laughs) I'm serious. This works. It should never work. It has no right working. But I'm telling you, on these nutrition questions, if answer B has chicken in it, I'm heading for it. <laughs> and I get it right like three out of four times and I'm just totally dead guessing. Of course, I don't go with fried chicken because I know that, I mean, I'm bad, but I know that's bad. You know, fried's no good. But if it's baked chicken, oh man, that's the meal I'm picking. Now, if chicken's not there, I pick fish. But I don't pick shellfish. Like lobsters and what? Because they're high in cholesterol. So I, I pick just the regular fish. The non, the scale fish, not the shell fish. <clears throat> Number two, never pick casseroles for children. If they ask you what's a good meal for this child and it's a little kid, don't pick a casserole. Tuna, tofu, and alfalfa casserole. It may be wonderfully nutritious, but they won't eat it. So don't pick a casserole for them. Number two, never mix medication in children's food. By the way, before you mix medication in anyone's food, what must you ask for? Permission. You never Mickey Finn patient's food. Okay? And I know that when you... I, I worked in nursing homes, and I Mickey Finn 90% of my patient's food. But on the boards, I won't do it. Okay? Toddlers, it's finger food. It's finger food. In other words, what's a better meal for a toddler? Hot dogs and french fries or a tofu bean curd and alfalfa sprout salad? The hot dog and the french fries, even though the other one is much more nutritious. See, when they give you a toddler question, it's not about nutrition content. It's about what can they eat on the run. So it, it may be not very healthy, but it's finger food, so go for it. I have to laugh. They always say, I I, I love statistics and research projects, but this research, big research project came out of Ann Arbor. Well, I should have known already. Um, That hot dogs and popcorn are the top two things that toddlers choke on. Duh! What are the top two things that toddlers eat? Hot dogs and popcorn. Do you see what I'm saying? If, 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 uh, 
tofu tofu squares and bok choy were the top two things toddlers ate, what would be the top two things they choke on? Tofu squares and bok choy. So you got to watch that stuff, but it's just kind of crazy. Anyhow, preschoolers, leave them alone. Leave <laughs> them alone. What's that mean? One meal a day is okay. What do you know about toddler at preschool eating habits? They eat when they're hungry and they may not eat but one meal a day and they eat the same thing every day for seven weeks. <laughs> then they change it and eat that for seven weeks. So what do you do as, as healthcare workers and parents? Leave them alone. There's no such thing as anorexia nervosa of preschool. They don't say, ooh, I like that. No, they don't. They eat when they are hungry. Why do they not need the food that the toddler needed? Exactly. What's the growth curve of an infant? Like that. What's the growth curve of a toddler? Like that. What's the growth curve curve of a preschooler? That. Who needs more? Does, when a kid went from toddler to preschool, what happened to his nutritional needs? They bottomed out. What do parents always freak out? He isn't eating like he used to. Oh, he's a preschooler. He's not growing like he used to. And parents don't get that. That when you shift from toddler to preschool, they're going to stop eating and that's okay. One meal a day is okay. We have a rule at our house. You take one bite of everything on your plate, but you don't have to eat anything else if you don't want to. But you have to take one bite of everything. And if that's when you're done, you're done. My brother, who was a pediatrician who should have known better, he had kids too. And his rule was, you eat everything on your plate. And you are not getting off this table until everything your plate is licked clean. It is really, really interesting that my daughters are all perfect weight for size. I mean, they're all, the, they could walk through the hourglass figure for the, you know, perfect 20-year-old female, friend. No, not an ounce of fat here or there that shouldn't be there. His kids are... <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And I'm, I'm just saying, I, I have my suspicions of where that started. Because in their lives, what made them good and obedient? Food. And food was what reinforced if you were good or bad, obedient or disobedient. And so, do you know what I'm saying? And my kids' food was just... Food. You know, so I don't know. It's interesting. Okay, who cares? Let's move on. Um, <laughs> pharmacology. But I'm just telling you that for your own thoughts, okay? Um, pharmacology. I have to guess all the time in farm. The most commonly tested area in farm is side effects. You do not have to memorize dosages. Please don't do that. Don't memorize routes. Don't memorize frequencies. If you're going to do any memorization of drugs, please memorize side effects. Why? Because you are a nurse. Your job is to assess for side effects and see if things are working. Your not, job is not to prescribe the dose, prescribe the frequency, prescribe the route. Now, there are some where they might give you a dose that makes sense or doesn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? Like dig. 10,000 milligrams, you know, that kind of thing. So number two, number two, if you know what a drug does, but you don't know the side effects, how should you proceed? Have you ever been in that situation? You go, oh, I know that drug. It's protonics. It's a proton pump inhibitor. It, it prevents ulceration in the gut. And then it says, what are the side effects? And you go, oh, I didn't know that. If you'd asked me what it was, I knew. Do you see what I'm Have you ever been there? You know the drug, but you don't know the side effects? great guessing rule that would give you the answer almost 80% of the time. Four out of five times. Pick a side effect in the same body system where the drug is working. Let me illustrate this. If you got a question about a drug, you let's say you knew the drug was a GI drug, but you didn't know the side effects, would you pick drowsiness, tachycardia, or diarrhea. diarrhea? 
If you knew it was a heart drug, but you didn't know what the side effects were, would you pick drowsiness, tachycardia, or diarrhea? Tachycardia. If you knew it was a central nervous system drug, but you didn't know what the side effects were, would you pick drowsiness, tachycardia, or diarrhea? Drowsiness. That works so much for me. It's really, really big. Doesn't it make sense, though? If a drug is having a therapeutic effect in certain areas, it's also going to have some side effects there, too. So why would a CNS drug have a problem with your gut? You know what I mean? That, that's kind of the question we'd ask. What about number three? Do you think this might happen to you? If you have absolutely no clue what the drug even is, you swear you've never heard of it. Have you? Could that happen? Okay. You're not dead yet. You're close, but you're not dead yet. Uh, look to see if it's PO. If they said it was PO, I think you might have dodged a bullet two out of three times. At least 50-50, you're going to dodge the bullet. Pick a GI side effect. If it's PO, pick a GI side effect. <coughs> that works about 50-50. And you say, well, that's not very good. It's better than one in four, isn't it? So that helps me with some questions, particularly the really hard ones. Number four, never tell a child that medicine is candy. Because if you tell them, oh, this is candy, this is candy, when they go home, what are they going to think medicine is? Candy. So when you run out of Halloween candy at Halloween time, they're going to pass out Grandma's Valium. <laughs> right? To all these little kids. No, that actually happened to my brother. He's a pediatrician. He was working in Chicago. He worked at the Hyde Park Clinic in Chicago. And Halloween, he was working in the ER area. And this one little kid came in with these symptoms that looked an awful lot like uh, tofranil poisoning, you know, an antidepressant poisoning. And they thought, hmm, that's interesting. So then about 10 minutes later, another kid came in with the exact symptoms. And then an hour later, another kid came in. And then about a half hour later, a fourth kid came in. What happened was they all, all four of those kids had gone to the same house and there was a little kid literally passing out his parents' tofranil to all the little kids for Halloween candy because he had been in the hospital the week before and was told it was candy. So he said, I thought that was a real interesting. He got an article in the American Journal of Medicine on that one. Okay. Um, OB. What's the ace of spades answer in OB? Check the fetal heart rate. Yeah, check the fetal heart rate. Med surge. What's the first thing you assess in a med surge situation? What's the first thing you assess in med surge? Level of consciousness. Bingo. Not airway. Airway is not the first thing you assess. Think about a code. You're in a code. You're doing basic life support, all righty? Or advanced cardiac life support. What's the first thing you do? Annie, 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 or what's your name, or are you okay? What's that? Level of consciousness. Then you do your A, B, C's. So A, B, C doesn't even win there. Okay? But number two, what is the first thing you do now? What's the first thing you do in a med search situation if you're guessing? Establish an airway. So that will work there. <clears throat> okay, let's turn the page. <clears throat> Pediatric guessing skills for growth and development. How many of you in here aren't really good at growth and development? You're joining me. I wish I had these rules that I'm going to give you right now when I was in peds because I'd have done a lot better. Because my experience in peds was particularly growth and development, I could always narrow it down to two. And after that, I was dead. Because it seemed like two ages were reasonable, two tasks were reasonable. Here's the deal. Three rules of growth and development questions. They are all based on the principle, always give the child more time. Always give the child more time. More time to what? Grow and develop. In other words, don't rush children's growth and development. Don't rush it. Always give the child more time to grow and develop. So let's talk about these rules. Rule number one, when in doubt, call it normal. Now this is radically different than med surge. In med surge, what's the rule? When in doubt, call it abnormal so you don't make a safety mistake. But in growth and development, when in doubt, call it 
normal. So what would be the right answer to the question? See, why did I why is the question written the way it is? What age did they give you? What task did they say? What's the problem with that question? Hmm? It varies. It's on the line. So some six-year-olds can read and some six-year-olds can't read. So it was purposely written to confuse you so that you didn't know what to pick. And since you didn't know what to pick, they were waiting to see if you would give the child more time by calling it normal. And that's exactly what they do. They purposely give you ages and tasks where it could go either way and ask you what's going on here. And so you always call it Normal. Now, what about this? You have a 13-year-old who isn't potty trained. <laughs> Did I say call that normal? But you shouldn't be in doubt. I said, when in doubt, call it normal. I didn't say to call everything normal. That's using your knowledge first. Is it, are you starting to understand that? Okay, second rule. Rule number two. When in doubt, pick the older age. I don't know about you guys, but whenever they ask at what age should a kid be able to do a certain thing, I could always narrow it down to how many? Two. And I never knew which one to pick. When I started using this rule, my scores went through the roof, went way up. I picked the older age. Not the, not the old desk, but the older age in the two that it could be. So in the question here, at what age should a child be able to walk? There are two ages where it could be. What could those be? B and C. 12 and what? 14 months was it? Yeah. So what would you pick? 14. Because you're giving the kid more time. Yeah, some kids could walk at 12. But give them a couple more months. Are you seeing the principle? <clears throat> and then rule number three, when in doubt, pick the easier task. I always got questions where they said, a kid is a certain age, what task have they mastered? And they'll give me four tasks. I could always narrow it down to how many? Two. And I never knew which one to pick. If Once I started using this rule, my scores went way up. Why do I pick the easier task? Because I'm giving him more time to do the harder one. Now, look at a six-month-old kid. There are two tasks there that a six-month-old kid probably would be doing, working on, or trying to, to do. What would be those two that they would be working on or trying to do? B and C, rolling over and sitting up. Okay, so what's the answer? Roll over, because that's easier than sit up. Do you understand that in growth and development, they always give you two right answers on purpose? See, I thought there was one right answer and one wrong one, and I just was stupid and didn't know the difference. No, they always give you these, in growth and development in particular, they give you two right answers. And they want to see, are you going to call it Normal, pick the older age and pick the easier task. When you get growth and development questions, what do I want you to be chanting in your head? Normal, older, easier. Normal, older, easier. Okay? <clears throat> Literally, my scores on a growth and development test went from an average between 38 and 48 percent to 70 to 78% in a day when I started using these rules. And I didn't learn any more information. It just, I finally figured out what they were up to. Okay, general guessing skills. Rule out absolutes. Why are absolutes not good answers? Yeah, and all you have to do is find one situation where it doesn't apply and it's wrong. Now, did I say never pick an absolute as your answer? Because aren't there some absolutes that you should know? Like never push potassium IV. Never give a med to a patient unless you can identify. Right? Those are absolutes and they're correct. Why can you pick them? Because of your knowledge. But I'm saying if you're guessing, don't pick them. Number two, if two answers say the same thing, neither one is right. Why can it be this? I had a HESI test last spring, and it asked me about a disease I never heard of before. And it asked me, what would you see 
A said increased vowel sounds. B said something else. C said borborygmy. And D said something else. Well, I immediately ruled out increased vowel sounds and borborygmy because they were the same thing. Then I figured which one of the remaining ones would be logical. I picked it and got it right. And that was just a guess. Number three, if two answers are opposite, one of them is probably right. If two answers are opposite, one of them is probably right. <coughs> Number four, the umbrella strategy. <coughs> I like this one. This one helps me out a lot. It says one answer, which answer is more global? Have you ever had the experience, and I have it a lot, on tests where I want to say all of the above, but that's not there? Have you ever had that experience? Mm -hmm. I want to say all of the above, but that's not an option. If that's the experience you're having, look for an, um, look for an umbrella answer. What I mean by an umbrella answer is an, an answer that covers, like an umbrella, covers all the others without saying it does. An answer that's so broad that when you do it, you do all the others. So look at our example. What is the umbrella answer? B. Because if you do that, you do all the others. Um, I, was, we were, I was doing a test with a student that had some trouble with, with tests and uh, we ran across one the other day. It said, when you transfer a patient from a bed to a wheelchair, oh, it was a meds pub test question. When you transfer a patient from a bed to a wheelchair, what's important to do? A, bring the chair as close to the bed as possible. B, remove the foot pedal from the chair so you don't trip over it. C, use safety and good body mechanics when transferring. D, lead into the bed with the strong foot. Well, all of them are correct. And I'm going, well, they're all right, they're all right. Wait a minute, Mark. And look for an umbrella. The answer was C, use safety and good body mechanics. when Because all those were, do you see how that works? I, I'm surprised that it works as much as it really does. Number five. If the question gives you four right answers right answers and asked you to pick the one with the highest priority. Now you realize that an hour ago we talked about prioritization, right? What were we prioritizing? For what? Different patients. When you get a question that's prioritization of four different patients, use the rules I taught you an hour ago. However, if they give you one patient and ask you which of the following needs is highest priority. Don't use what I, what I taught you before won't work. That's for prioritizing different patients. What do you do here? Well, you do what I call the worst consequences game. Take each option, A, B, C, and D, and ask yourself, if I did not do this, what is the worst thing that would happen? Then the best answer is the one that has the worst Outcome if you don't do it. Now, let me, I know that sounds crazy, but let me illustrate it in the question below. Which of the following is highest priority in caring for a suicidal patient? How many patients do you have? One. One. So those rules I taught you about before, do those apply? No. no. So let's take each answer. If you do not give him a tranquilizer, what is the worst thing that would happen? He'd be agitated. Okay. If you don't... <coughs> Orient him to the unit. What's the worst thing that would happen? He'd get lost and disoriented. If you don't put him on suicide precautions, what's the worst that would happen? He'd be dead. If you don't introduce him to the staff, what's the worst that would happen? Wouldn't know anybody. So, of being agitated, lost, dead, and not knowing anybody, what's the worst? Dead. So what's the highest priority? Suicide precautions. So let's do it with the next one. Ask yourself, what's the worst thing would happen if I didn't have sips of water? What's the worst thing that would happen if I didn't have pain meds? What's the worst thing that would happen if the side rails weren't up? What's the worst thing that would happen if I didn't use the abductor pillow? Not just something bad, but the worst thing that would happen.
What's your answer? Side rails. Yeah, because if you didn't, what's the worst thing that would happen if you didn't do the sips of water? De- not thirsty is not bad enough. They get dehydrated. Okay? If they didn't have pain meds, they'd be in severe pain. If you didn't put the side rails up, what would happen? Fall, break, hips, head, multiple injuries. If you didn't use an abductor pill, pill oh, what's the worst thing that would happen? Mess up the hip. So of being dehydrated, severe pain, messing up the hip and everything else, and messing up the hip, what's the worst of the worst? Messing up the hip and other injuries, so the side rails is number one. Are you seeing that? Okay. You could also juxtapose C and D, couldn't you? You could say, if I put the side rails up but didn't use the abductor pillow, or I used the abductor pillow but left the side rails down. You hear that? Which would be better? Use, put the side rails up and don't use an abductor pillow, or use an abductor pillow and leave the side rails down. What would be better? You get the side rails, you know, you're, re- you're getting the more hot water for the side rails down. Okay, uh, eight. When you're stuck between two answers, read the question. Where's the clue to the answers? In the question, not the answers. So quit reading and rereading answers. Go back and read the question. You probably missed something. Okay, the last page. Right? The Sesame Street rule. You have my permission to use this rule when and only when... <coughs> Your only remaining option is to do this. <laughs> okay, if you're at that point, what should you use? Sesame Street rule. But if you use it before then, you will fail. Boards. Because this is a dangerous one to use, but it's the one you use when nothing else works. Do you remember Sesame Street? Three of these things belong with the others. One of these things just isn't the same. Remember that? And they'd show you three sailboats and a kumquat, and you had to figure out which one was different. Right? Okay. Well, right answers tend to be different than the others. Why? Right, the right answer tends to be different than the others. Why? Because it is the only one which is right. correct. Exactly. However, the wrong answers all are similar because they share something in common, and that is that they are all wrong. So by virtue of that, the right answer is the most unique or different answer. So in our question below, what would be the correct answer? C would be the correct answer. All right. Number eight, don't be tempted to answer a question based on your ignorance instead of your knowledge. And you guys say, oh, I don't do that. Oh, yes, you do. You do it. I know you do it. I want to illustrate something really quickly. Do you see this question below about amicacin? I'm going to do something here. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to role play a student who answers that question based on ignorance, meaning what they don't know. Then I'm going to role play another student who answers it based on what they do know. But the interesting thing you're going to notice about those two students is they know the exact same amount. One does not know any more than the other. So let me illustrate this. Who am I right now? The student that's answering based on what? Ignorance. Ignorance. Okay, here we go. Here's, Here's what ignorance answers do. Which of the following is important to do in the administration of amicacin IV piggyback? Oh my goodness. Amicacin. Oh, man. I knew I was going to get these stupid drugs I don't know. Why does it always happen to me? Why? I knew. Oh, amacacin, amacacin, sin, amac, max, 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 amacacin. Oh, man. I don't know my case. Okay. Amacacin, how do you figure out? Cover the bag with foil to protect from light. What? Okay. Use an uh, IV pump. What? Amacacin, how do you figure that? Oh, stupid. Mount Carmel Pharmacology class never taught us that. <laughs> if Mark, why didn't Mark tell us about this? If it was going to be on her, why didn't he mention it? It wasn't in the blue book or the yellow book. Um, amicacin. Amicacin. Oh, man. 
cover the bag with foil to protect from light. Hmm. Now you know. <laughs> if I wanted to protect it from light, covering with foil would work. <laughs> hmm. And I know some drugs are biodegraded by UV radiation. Hmm. I've never heard of amicacin, and I've never heard of covering bags with foil. So they probably go together. <laughs> because had I heard of amicacin, I would immediately know if you did or did not do that. And if I had heard of doing that, I would have known which drug it was, like amicacin. So since I don't know either one, this is probably some obscure fact about some obscure drug, and I'm not going to let him trick me, so I'm going to pick cover the bag with ball to protect from the <laughs> All right, now, second student. This is going to base his answer on what? What they know, not what they don't know. Okay, let's go. Uh, what is important to do in the administration of amicacin IV pig? Amicacin, oh man. Amicacin, why do I always get these drug ones I don't know? I knew this was going to happen when I took boards. I would get all these drugs I didn't know. Amicacin, amicacin, maxin, kiss mac, am, amicacin. Oh man, nothing. Okay, cover the bag with water to protect from light. What? Use an IV pump. Oh. Amicacin. Stupid Mount Carmel Pharmacology. <laughs> Never taught us about this. Mark should have told us. It wasn't in the yellow book. It wasn't in the blue book. If it was going to be on, he should have let us know. Man, why is this always happening to me? Amicacin. Okay. All right. I don't know amicacin. I don't know it. I can't answer this question based on amicacin because I don't know it. So let me take amicacin out of the question. See what's left. See if there's anything I do know something about. Okay, what is important in the administration of uh, IV piggyback? Oh, IV piggybacks. I know IV piggybacks. I've given them. I've seen them given, and every time I've seen them given, 99% of the time they're on a pump. So I'm picking pump. Now, who got the question right? First one or second one? Second one. And did they know anything more about amicacin than they did? No. What did they learn about the first person? What did the boards learn about the first person? When they don't know what to do, what do they do? They go around covering bags in foil. <laughs> what did they learn about the second person? When they don't know what a drug is, they put it on a pump. Who would you license? No, I'm serious. Who <laughs> would you like? Do you see what I'm saying? But don't. See, here's the deal. If you don't know what something is, what should you do? Pull it what? Away. Out of the question. Read the question without it there and see what happens. I, I had a student that was really bad at this. I knew she finally got it when we did a question like this. And she finally said, it said what is important to do to, to teach parents of a kid going home on Penn VK suspension? And she sweat pen VK for like 20 minutes, not really, but you know, for a minute or two, sweating what pen VK was. What's pen VK? What's pen VK? I don't know pen VK. I don't know pen VK. And then she looked at me and she said, oh, I don't know what it is, do I? And I said, do you? And she said, no. And she says, I'm supposed to pull that out of the question, aren't I? And I said, do you think you are? She said, yeah, I think I am. And I says, should, she said, should I do it? And I said, do you think you should do it? And she said, she said, yeah, I'll do it. So she reread the question. What did it do? What did it read when she pulled out pen VK? What's important to teach the parents of a child going home on a suspension? And she said, oh, my goodness, it's letter D, isn't it? And I said, yeah. You know what D said? Shake well before giving. <laughs> and that was the right answer. Do you understand? Boards will give you things you've never heard of for the purpose of seeing if you use common sense. 
See, if I want to measure your common sense, this, if I want to measure this whole class as common sense, I have to ask something about which none of you know, you, none of you have knowledge. Because if you don't have knowledge, what do you have to use? Common sense. So I have to ask you about a drug nobody's ever what? Heard of. A disease that no one's ever heard of. Or a treatment that no one's ever heard of. And that way I can measure what? Common sense. So when you get something you don't know, use your common sense. It's probably a really, really easy question. So don't freak out that it's hard. And that happens a lot in the first ten. Use your common sense in the first ten. Do not overanalyze those first ten questions. Take them as though you weren't even a nurse. Say to yourself, what I think Aunt Billy would answer for this one. You know, it's just, they're so off, they're, they're ambiguous, but they are very clear. Not clear, but they're very, everybody gets them right even though they're vague. All right? Now, last things. If something really seems right, it probably is. My point there is, are, do I have any gut changers here? People who go against their gut answer, stop it. <laughs> you have no right to go away from your gut answer unless you could prove why the other one is superior. Not just as good, but what? Superior. superior. So if you have a gut draw to letter B, you, your gut answer is B, and but you think, oh, well, 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 maybe it's C. Should you pick C? Not unless what? Not unless you could articulate a reason why C is what? Superior. Superior. Not just as good. There is a mini mark on your shoulder when you take this test. I am there. I'm sitting right there. Little mini mark is right there. And when you go to change from your gut, what is mini mark going to say? Why is that superior? Why is that superior? And if you cannot tell me why, you get your hand off that button and you pick your gut. Alrighty? So don't go... Research has shown that you change from right to wrong twice as much as you change from wrong to right. So it's a losing battle. Don't do it. Number 10, if you don't know the answer, you do know the answer, use your common sense. Alright, that's it for the review. I just wanted to give you three parting shots on that last page. Just three things and then we're done. Okay, Mark, move it. Three expectations you're not allowed to have. Do you know what fails the people fails people a lot? They get taken the test, and during the test, it wasn't what they expected. It wasn't what they were hoping for. It wasn't what they wanted. And that breeds negativity. And then that negativity affects their what? Performance. And then what happens? They fail. So what failed them? Their negativity. Where did their negativity come from? It didn't live up to it, their expectations. It wasn't what I expected. Well, here are three expectations you are not allowed to have. If you have these expectations, get rid of them right now. They are dangerous. They will kill you on this test. First expectation. Don't expect 75 for the RN or 85 for the LPN. Don't expect 75 or 85 questions. Don't expect it. Go there expecting 265 or 205, depending on whether you're an LPN or an RN. Go there and prepare yourself psychologically, mentally, physically, emotionally to go for the whole maximum. You know what happens? I know this happens. I've heard people say it all the time. They say, oh, I, I, I want 75 questions. I hope I get 75 questions. They've got the whole church praying, Dear Lord, let Sally have 75 questions. You know, it's on the church website. You know, pray for Sally that she has 75 questions when she takes... That's so stupid. Because what happens? When you go take that test and you hit 75 and you answer it and you hit the button and it goes 76, what do you do? <gasps> and then you hit 110. And then you're... Uh, and then it's 198. And then 215, you start going, what? This is horrible. This is terrible. This, I'm doing so bad. This is horrible. I just can't stand this. So what's entering your mind? Negativity. What happens to your performance? It's going down. Why do you fail? You failed because you had this unrealistic goal of 75. Expect 265. In fact, the longer you go, 
You're doing fine. Everybody says, oh, I want 75. Well, that's dumb. Because uh, somebody said, no, here's, here's what they say. They say, I got to 200 and I knew I was failing. That was, that's the stupidest thing ever uttered by a human being. Because this is a computer adaptive test. If you got to 200 and you were failing, what would it have done? And if you were failing, what would it have done? Shut off. So the only way you're getting to 200 is if you're not what? Failing. You aren't failing. Now, are you doing a bang-up job? No. But who do you think you are? Who do you think? Are you God's gift to nursing? No, you're average. So you're going to be average. So don't. Do you see what I'm saying? If you get 220, if you're on question 220, what should you say? Okay, I'm still in, I'm still in the game. 223, I'm still in the game. 224, I'm still in the game. 225, oh, it shut off. And everybody says to me, Mark, well, when you tell me that, when it shuts off, I'm going to freak out. My reply to them is, I don't care. I do not care what you do after it shuts off. All I care about is what you do before it shuts off. So freak out all you want afterward. Don't freak out before. The reality is the same number of people, same percentage of people pass at 265 as pass at 75. And every number in between. And there's this rumor out there that says if you go to 265, the percentage of people failing is like two or three times at 75. That's a, that's a person that's never looked at the statistics, the scattergrams of the tests, which I have done every year since it was its inception. So, they're wrong. And the myth about every once in a while, somebody randomly gets 265 is baloney. That is, that's baloney. If you ever heard that from somebody, that's a myth. It's not true. You get, everybody gets a computer adaptive test. Everyone does. And the number you get is based on your performance. Okay? All right. So, don't expect what? Expect how many? The whole bit. Okay, number two, don't expect to know everything. Why? Because it's computer adaptive. You're not going to know everything. Even if you're acing it, they're going to bring out stuff you've never heard of. So don't worry about not knowing everything. Number three, don't expect everything to go right. What I mean by is don't expect the birds to sing, sunshiny day, you get a parking spot right up front. Sometimes you got a person sitting next to you that goes... <sighs> Every five minutes. You know what I mean? <laughs> Don't let that fail you. Now, you do have an option to say, would you get this snort snotter out of here? But <laughs> you have some say, no, listen, think about it. Just last thing. Last thing I'm going to say. Isn't it true that everybody in this room, in your program, would have had at least three or four or five times in your program to legitimately quit if you just stopped, you'd have been totally legitimate because it was, it was ridiculous. But you're, and you would have had a reason to quit. Is that true? But what did you do? You stuck it out. Was it pretty? No. Did it get ugly at times? Did it get messy? Was it hard? But what did you do? You stuck it out. So you know what that tells me about you? Everybody in this room, you have perseverance. You have a strength of character and a perseverance to slug it out when it gets tough. Or you wouldn't even be sitting here. When you take this test, it's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. It may not be pretty. It may be sloppy. It may be messy. But you have what? Perseverance, Perseverance and an intense uh, strength of character to get through that. You can get through it. And get through it one question at a time. Just answer one. Forget about it. Move to the next. That's how you got through school. That's how you get through here. Correct? Because at the beginning, if you thought about the whole thing, you would have quit. So, just go there. Okay, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate all you guys. And if you see me around, if you see me around, just say, who can sterilize my bowel? And I'm in the middle. You. Uh, also, I go by word of mouth, so if you want to tell other people about the review, that's fine with me. Sure.